If you've ever watched the Reverend Joel Osteen on television, you know that before he gives his message, he always has something funny to say. Well, if you've ever heard me preach, you know that I always have a definition to start my message. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Having said that, Nelson's new illustrated Bible dictionary defines the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity who exercised the power of the Father and the Son in creation and redemption. In other words, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity when we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are the three which make our God a triune God. Our hymn of preparation, Spirit of the Living God, is one of my favorites. It always puts me in a receiving mode. Melt me, lets us know that we must let the Holy Spirit empty us, get rid of bad habits, unclean living, and anything that hinders us from having a right relationship with God. Mold me, telling us that the Holy Spirit can make us into what is needed to further the kingdom of God here on earth, just like a ball of clay that has nothing but just a substance, no shape, that's it. We can be changed from nothing good to something useful. Fill me, says the Holy Spirit is in us fully and completely. Use me. Let the power of the Holy Spirit position us to do God's will, to love one another, to take care of one another, to show others we are Christians by our words and our deeds, and also to evangelize at every opportunity. This sermon title, Life in the Spirit, is taken from our second scripture lesson, Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 12 through 25, and other relevant scriptures. Now, Paul wrote this book of Romans, and in these writings, he is presuming that the readers are seasoned Christians. And I tell you this because if some of you have difficulty reading it, that's the reason. Of course, with all scripture reading and Bible study, these should first start with prayer, asking God to open our minds and hearts to his word. After reading, as if there is something we do not understand, then read it again and ask God to send the Holy Spirit to help you through his word. The book of Romans was written sometime between 55 and 58 AD probably while Paul was in Corinth. One of Paul's purposes for writing this letter is to introduce himself and his message to the believers in Rome. Well, what is Paul's message? His message is to remind the believers and to advise the others that life in the spirit and life in the flesh are opposed to one another. As said in Romans 8.13, if we live according to the flesh, we will die. Now, I certainly don't want to die of sin. Do any of you? No. I didn't think so. Jesus paid the price for our sins, and this was not something we earned, and we certainly cannot repay him. But if we live in the flesh, turning away from God, we will die. If we live in the spirit, we will be with our Lord throughout eternity. Amen? Amen. How do we live in the Spirit? Well, let me ask you a few questions. How many of you worked jobs that require training? Okay. The training prepared you for the job you were going to perform, right? right? Same thing if you go to the gym or have a personal trainer. You must exercise to see results, right? Yes. 1 Timothy 4, 7, 8 tells us that we must exercise ourselves to godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. 
So it is to live in the Spirit. Now, how do we train for living in the Spirit? There's public worship, Bible study, partaking of Holy Communion, personal and community prayer, fasting, not a complete list. All of these strengthen us to live spiritual lives. I saw this quote in a newsletter last week, and I believe it applies. It's an anonymous quote that says, where there is no challenge, there is no change. Where there is no challenge, there is no change. I know people say they can have religion and lead Christian lives on their own, that they don't need to come to church for worship. Well, church, let me tell you, this cannot be done, living a solitary life. If we look at Jesus' example, we see that there were a few times that he isolated himself from the people and the disciples. And when he did, it was to pray, talk with and commune with God his Father. Living in the Spirit is not an easy lifestyle for many of us because it seems the closer we walk with God, the more Satan is trying to separate us. But Romans 8.38 says, Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, not depth, not height, mm -hmm. not anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. When we live in the flesh, the Ten Commandments may not have much meaning. Also, there may be little moral fortitude. That is living by our own rules. That does not mean everything a person might do is wrong. Many people who do not believe in Jesus lead lives loving, caring, being hospitable, working for a living, being good, profitable providers, good parents. But that does not mean they will go to be with Christ. Because what did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must be born again. Amen? Yeah. We must believe that Jesus is the Christ and that he died on the cross, paying the ultimate price for our salvation and rose again according to the scriptures. That man or woman could be the most active philanthropist in the world, but they cannot buy their way into heaven. You have to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. Now, following the Ten Commandments is a good start to living in the Spirit, loving what is good, loving one another, contributing to the needs of the people, extending hospitality to strangers. And that doesn't mean picking people up off the street and taking them to your home. That could be a security risk, you know? It means being polite and welcoming. We can certainly exhibit that behavior here, and we do, right? We must live in harmony with others, praying and asking for forgiveness for those who persecute us. Jesus did. Remember in Luke 23, 34, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Also, Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We must try to live by Jesus' example, as difficult as that might seem. If we ask the Holy Spirit to help us with our Christian walk, day by day, praying without ceasing, being sincere in our quest for a life in the Spirit, we will achieve that goal. When we weep with those who weep, there is a human bond that is strengthened. Do you remember how close you felt with someone who was grieving? Do you remember how you felt when you reached out your hand to someone in the hospital who was dying? Do you remember that closeness? That was the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you spoken words of wisdom to 
person in need and then wondered where those words came from. That was the Holy Spirit. I remember when my nephew Dorian was four years old and our vacation Bible school at that time was during the day. His parents worked, Gene and I worked, and we couldn't bring him. But my scripture partner at work told me that her church had an evening vacation Bible school and she invited us. The first evening after the children left their classes, they convened into the sanctuary and the teacher was recapping what they learned about Jesus. Dorian looked around and said, Aunt Louise, where is Jesus? And before I could answer, a man came into the back of the sanctuary and he said, is that Jesus? And I said, no. And then I said, Dorian, do you love your mom and dad? And he said, yes. And I said, can you see love? And he said, no. I said, Jesus is like that. He loves us. He's all around, but we can't see him. Do you understand this? And he said, yes. After that, I said, Jesus, thank you for helping me to explain to a child. That was actually the Holy Spirit guiding me. There is no way, let me tell you, no way that I could have come up with that answer on my own. I'm sure you have examples of times when the right words were said, the right actions were taken, without you ever having to think about it. That was the Holy Spirit working through you to touch the spirit of another person. I call them spiritual promptings. Sometimes thoughts of a person will come to me. I usually try to contact them by telephone, leave a message and let them know I'm praying for them. What happened last week with one of our church members, the lady called me back and said she appreciated my message and that she was having some issues and thanked me for my prayers. And I told her I would continue to pray for her. When we are continually filled with the Holy Spirit, our prayer life takes on a new dimension, one we never thought possible. Well, how do we get to that stage of spirit-filled living? Ephesians 6.18 says, pray in the spirit at all times. By prayer, acknowledge who God is. Call him by name. God, Father, Jehovah, eternal God, mighty God, or other names of reverence. By supplication, lay your request before him. Make them known to him, even though he knows what they are before you even ask. By an adoration, worship him, adore him, tell God how much you love him. By intercession, invite the Holy Spirit to help you pray. Let the Holy Spirit place the names and faces of people before you that need prayer. By thanksgiving, Spend time thanking Jesus for what he has done for you. Cite examples of his goodness. When we live in the spirit, we learn how to forgive ourselves. If God forgives us, and we know he does, then why can't we forgive ourselves? It's because we live in the flesh and Satan is ruling us. Satan is the creator of havoc in our lives. When we live with guilt for sins or immoral behavior, he doesn't want us to forget it. He doesn't want us to forget it because we'll think, I've already sinned. I'm going to hell anyway. I might as well keep on sinning. You know he never sleeps. He's always on his job. When you have a choice of doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing, Satan is that voice that says, nothing good is going to come from doing the right thing. There is gain from doing what God, what goes against God. Shut down that voice. Cry out to the Holy Spirit to close your mind to the voice of Satan. Tell Satan to get behind you. Tell Satan that he is not your ruler. 
that you belong to the Most High God. Amen? Amen. Amen. The creator of love, joy, and peace. The creator of your life. The one who wants you to live with him through eternity. Resist the bonds of Satan and enjoy a life of freedom. In order to live in the Spirit, we need to know what the fruits of the Spirit are. Love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We must remember that God is not to be mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Galatians 6, 8 says, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Church, these scriptures in the Bible are repeated over and over again, so that if we didn't get the first few times, Maybe we will get it later in our readings. God does not want anyone to die to sin. He sent an advocate for us in Jesus Christ. We need to trust him. We need to know also what walking in the flesh entails. Uncleanness, idolatry, fornication, sorcery, hatred, adultery, selfish ambitions, heresies, murder, drunkenness, domestic violence, drug abuse, gossiping, voyeurism, and conceit, to name a few. The flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit is against the flesh. They are contrary to one another. Romans 8.15 says, as children of God, we do not fear because we were given a spirit, not of fear, but of victory. When we cry out to the Lord, it is that very spirit that bears witness that we are heirs of God's and joint heirs with Christ. Paul goes on to tell the Romans in 818 that the sufferings and persecutions of today cannot be compared with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. All living things are subject to decay and death, yet in faith we look forward to a day when all of God's creatures will be set free from death. As I end, let me say, let us be careful how we live, not as people of flesh, but as people living in the Spirit, praying, loving one another, singing hymns, reading psalms, making melody to the Lord in our hearts. Let us give thanks for everything in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.